So the first effect is the spiritual one, which leads to sort of bad behavior, a lack of inclination towards the religion. Overeating of halal also has an effect on a person. When you overeat halal, even overeating, the first thing that it does is it makes a person lazy in their prayers, in their ibadat. You find it in Shah Ramadan. You know, all day you've been hungry, it's fine. And then iftar comes, and if you don't pray Maghrib first, and you just go and you start eating, eating, and then you just, everyone's ready to pass out. Forget Salat al forget Salat Ja'far Tayyar, forget the A'mal of every night. Oh, we're done now, Baba. Until Suhoor, no one wake us up. Yeah, we just about do that. And if we, we're unfortunate enough to eat before Maghrib, then, you know, the sajda of namaz maghrib and namaz al is very difficult because we've overeaten and I can't breathe. Yeah? So having, eating less will give you the vigor in your ibadat. Excessive eating will slow down your ibadat. The second or the third effect that is more prominent and related to Karbala is when someone consumes haram, they cannot differentiate between the hujjah of Allah and the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, Sayyidul Shuhada says in Karbala to the enemy, uh, to the army of Yazid, he says to them, you know why my words are having no effect on you? قَدْ مُلِئَتْ بُتُونَكُمْ مِنَ الْحَرَامِ is because your stomachs have been filled with food of haram. Your stomachs are filled with haram. It's not that they were going out and consuming haram meat. No, they were giving, getting money off an oppressor and they were taking that money, they were buying food and eating it. Over here, I don't know how strong your welfare system is, but in England, we have a pretty robust welfare system. And there you find people, you know, that are working 40 hour weeks or are self-employed. They'll be telling the government, no, no, we're only working 20 hours so that the government can top them up with the remaining amount of money. And although they're working and they're earning that amount of money, but they're lying for that extra. That lying to gain that money, that is haram. And the food that you buy with that money is haram. At a spiritual level, it's haram. When you consume it, it creates a spiritual defect. For example, if I'm a contractor, or if I'm someone who charges by the hour for my service, I look at uh, a problem that's presented to me, and I say, it's going to take two hours. And I charge the person for two hours. But I know full well that with my capability, I could finish this in an hour. But because I've said to them too, that additional hour's money that I've taken is haram. Mm -hmm. Because knowingly, if I say two, it's going to be about two hours. And it takes me less time. I haven't said 100%, but if I know 100% that it's only going to take me an hour, but I, and I quote them two hours, that additional hour is haram. And when I buy food with it and I consume it, this is what causes spiritual defects, spiritual illnesses, where a person can't differentiate between the hujjah of Allah and the enemies of Allah. And they're willing to kill the hujjah of Allah. Based upon food. And having less to eat, not eating so much, has an effect as well. Has, see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one of the uh, conversations with Nabi Musa says, Musa, I'm shocked at the people of the dunya, says that I have placed the ilm within hunger and thirst. Why is it that they seek knowledge while their bellies are full? Mm -hmm. Amir al says the same thing in Nahjul Balaba. He says, Al ilm fil jur says knowledge is within hunger. The more hungry you are, the more knowledge you will retain. We have it now that every time I've got an exam and it coincides with Shah Ramadan, I'm trying to look for a loophole. Oh, I can't do my exam. I can't do my studies. I can't write my assignment because it's Shah Ramadan, long days. I can't do it. Whereas Amir al-Mu'mineen saying that al-ilmu fil jur, 
Knowledge is within hunger. And staying hungry, one enlightenment of the heart and knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the one who stays hungry, who's accustomed themselves to hunger, they will always speak the truth. The second thing is that they will not care whether they live in poverty or whether they live in uh, riches. Because they're always accustomed to the hunger. Third thing will be husn al-da'im. There will be a constant sorrow in their hearts. Not sorrow in the, in the depressive sense, but sorrow in the sense of that the mu'min leave, lives between two states. The state of khawf and raja, the state of fear and hope. And to be able to reach that stage, fear that maybe that which I have done is not enough. When I look at the grandness and the majesty and what Allah has bestowed me and the, the blessings that Allah has bestowed upon me. And I look at my meager ibadat and I think this is not enough. This is where the khawf comes from. The raja, the hope comes that I'm still trying and he is Rahman, he is Rahim, he will still forgive me. But the believer lives between that. That husn da'im that lives in the heart of the believer is that I could have done more when it comes to my ibadat. And so hunger will create that husn da'im within a person. So truthfulness, they won't care whether they're in riches or in uh, poverty. They won't care. Well, or they will have this husn da'im within themselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that my abd is the closest to me at two points. The first is when he is hungry. When my abd is hungry, when my servant is hungry and they raise their hands for dua, Allah answers the person's dua. The second is when the abd is in the state of sajda. So this is the closest to me when he's in sajda. So imagine now an abd that is hungry, a servant of Allah that is hungry, but then also doing sajda and asking Allah for their dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never reject that dua. As long as the dua is reasonable, obviously. Uh, within the power of Allah. When the dua is within boundaries, sometimes you know we, we ask for dua that defy the laws of physics. I mean, yesterday I said to you that your know, duas we can ask for, you know, when we're asking for our dua, make sure that we go for the maximum, but obviously within the constraints of the dunya. You know, I can't turn around and be, you know, Allah oh, give me the ability to, um, you know, I don't know, fly or give me the ability to grow wings. I mean, fly is not a problem, but grow wings, for example, to fly. Uh, I said fly is not a problem, like I could do it. Uh, but I mean, in the sense of tay al ard, tay al ard, one of the things, like for example, du'a kumail, um, when Imam Ali teaches it to kumail ibn Ziyad al Nakhai, he says, kumail, this is the du'a of Nabi Khazar, and this is the du'a that enabled Khazar to do tay al ard. Tay al ard is what? To transport oneself from one place to another place in the blink of an eye. He says, this dua, this dua kumail that we read every Thursday night when I, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, Ya Allah, Matfili, Ya Danur, how many pages left? Oh my God, why they put the slow reciter on? That dua is what enabled Nabi Khidr to do Tayyil Ard, transport himself from one place to another in the blink of an eye. So the point being that this hunger. It brings not only knowledge, brings proximity to Allah, brings truthfulness. So when we accustom ourselves to hunger, you know some people are in such um, a bad state of not ever wanting to be hungry. They're always snacking. You know, they call it grazing. I'm just grazing. Like cows graze. <laughs> Cattle grazes. Humans are not made to graze. You know, there comes a time when you don't eat. Um, and even the riwayat, when they come to like the size of the meals and things to eat as well, it's just like have your heaviest meal in the morning and then peter off and the, the least, eat the least at night. We tend to eat the heaviest thing at night, you know, bring the biryani out and the pilau and everything, you know, you know, make sure you have this before you go to bed. 
obviously there's a there's going to be an issue and then it also slows a person down in their worship which is the most important part of the whole scenario so that's the hunger side the other thing i mentioned yesterday that i wanted to do quickly mention uh, about today was salat al-layl in regards to salat al-layl i taught you like i told you of the quicker way to recite it you, know, you can even recite it from your bed um, if you can't be bothered to, you know, get up, you just lay from your bed and do it with your fingers, and that's your Salat al-Layl done. But the effects of Salat al-Layl, like when they say, you know when you say, oh, that person had such nur on their face. You know, where does that nur come from? What is that nur? Allah nur samawati wal You see, the light, that primordial light, that, that what we refer to as nur isfabudiyya, the primordial light, the light from which all of existence came into uh, being, that light transcends and transmits through all of existence. And the only place that can contain that light is the heart of a human being, not the physical heart, the spiritual heart. So when we talk about a nur, and a person's nur is coming out, it's something that is already there. But because of the sin, we're blocking it from shining through. So Atul Layl is that thing that removes that rust and brings that nur to your face. There's no need for like fair and lovely and all of these things. You want that nur you know, that can be seen from the eyes. That is through Salat al-Layl. So not only does it give you that nur, the second thing that Salat al-Layl, its physical effects are Salat al-Layl, it removes bad breath from a person. A person that uh, doesn't recite Salat al will have bad breath, but the one that recites Salat al will never have bad breath. The third thing is that they will never have bad body odor. Their body will not produce bad body odor because they regularly recite Salat al -Layl. The fourth thing is that increase in rizq, increase in their, their sustenance that Allah gives. And rizq is not just money, but children are rizq, your house is rizq, your clothing is rizq, your cars, everything around you is sustenance from Allah. The air that you breathe is rizq. And so it increases in the risk of a person, it increases in the wealth of a person. It brings them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I'm there alone at night. No one can see me. And I'm there conversing with the beloved in the middle of the night. Because there's no element of takabur associated to it. Because I'm doing it alone, it's dark. Everyone else is asleep. You know, when um, Tawusa Yamani goes inside the Kaaba and he says, I saw a youth holding on to the Kaaba, beseeching, while all the people had left in Shah Ramadan as it got towards time of Sahab, they were leaving. He says, I saw this uh, youth holding on to the uh, uh, cloth of the Kaaba, crying out, Ilahi, my Lord. <coughs> the night has passed and the stars have disappeared and the doors of all the kings have been closed and they have placed guards at their doors but your door your door is still open for those that come and ask while the doors of the kings and the emperors have all closed and guards have been stationed there. Your door, my Lord, remains open for those that come and ask. And then at that moment, Tawusa Yamani says, I saw the youth faint. He says, I ran towards him to see who is this individual that recites in the way of the Anbiya of Allah. He says, when I looked closely, I realized it was Ali ibn al-Husayn, Imam al-Sajjad. In this level of ibadah, this desire, when Amirul Mu'mineen is struck on the twenty on the nineteenth uh, of Ramadan, and he's being brought back to the house, he turns to the sun as the sun is rising, and he says, "O oh sun, bear witness that uh, you never saw Ali sleep, but Ali always watched you rise." That that ability to stay awake for a portion of the night to recite that Salat al -Layl, to have that Muraja, have that conversation with the Beloved. Because that's what that conversation with Allah is. It is the musings of the lover to the Beloved. It's how the lovers interact with the Beloved. 
that they sit there and they talk about their problems. And you don't need lengthy du'as. You can just sit there and say, Allah, this was what my day was like. This is what this person said to me. Allah, help me with this problem. Allah, I've got the flu. Allah, you know, really, honestly, to this level, that just have a conversation. You don't need to do excessive du'as and things. Yes, if you can recite the du'as, excellent. But if you just want to create that connection, just sit there and have that conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a lot of that, when we become regular within our salat al layl we will see a number of benefits that will enter into our lives. Continuing our discussion on du'a makaram al akhlaq I'm not going to be able to finish. There's some 20-something characteristics that the Imam lists of the muttaqeen. The rest you can take as homework in the um, coming nights uh, to have a look at du'a makaram al akhlaq from uh, line uh, six there, uh, well actually from the end of line 61, 62 of Dua al you will see that we begin to list the sifat of the muttaqin. So yesterday we uh, began, uh, we looked at the strength of wasatr al aida the muttaqin are those that hide the faults of other people, they don't expose other people's faults. Walin al alika and they have a mild temper. They, you know, that if they do get angry, their anger is for the sake of Allah, and it goes straight away. You know, there's certain people who become so angry, and then they, it takes them ages to allow that anger to pass, and they, they become insane, and they can't think straight, and they do crazy things in the uh, grips of that anger. So the muttaqeen, the anger is mild. You know, the moment... And as soon as it comes, it subsides. It's only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Imam says, وَخَذْبَ الْجَنَاحِ And the lowering of the wing. This is metaphoric to humble, uh, humbling. يعني, the muttaqin are humble. They're individuals who do not consider themselves to be of any high station. Rather, they're always introspecting, always looking in on themselves and looking at their own faults. So when someone comes to praise them at the same time as receiving the praise and accepting, okay, this is something good I've done, but like we said a few nights ago at the start of the dua, we said, oh Allah, don't raise me amongst the people darajatan, illa haqattani agda nafsi mithraha, without lowering its equivalent within me. So I, even though I'm being praised, I want to lower myself within myself. Allahumma dhalla nafsi fi nafsi. Allah make me the lead within myself. That I never ever think of myself as something important. As something that is better or someone that is better than anyone. Because there is that day when a person will be raised and all of mankind will be the lead, humiliated on that day bar a few individuals. You know, that day is so fearful that Imam al-Sajjad himself, he says in Dua Abi Hamza Thumani that we recite in Shah Ramadan, he says, Famali la abki. says, my Lord, for what reason should I not cry? Abki li khuruj nafsi. Abki li dhulmat qabri. Abki li dhika lahdi. Abki li su'ali munkiri munikiri iyaaya. أبكي لخروج من قبري هريانا ذلينا حاملا ثقري على الظهر انظر مرة عن يميني وأخرى عن شمالي إذ الخلائق شأن غير شأني لكل امرأ منهم يوم إذ شأن يغني. says for what reason should I not cry? I cry for the time that my soul will be taken from my body, and I cry for the darkness of my grave. And I cry for the narrowness of my grave. And I cry for the questioning of Munkir and Nabir. I cry for the time that I will be taken out from my grave, naked, humiliated, carrying upon the back the burden of my sins. I will look to my left and look to the right and find that no one is concerned with me, that no one is bothered with me. For on that day, it is only the sins and the a'mal of that individual that count. On that day, Allah subhanahu 
Allah Ta'ala in the Holy Quran, He says that on that day, that that mother that is suckling her child shall throw the child to the ground and run away. That mother that is carrying a child shall miscarry her child and run away. The fathers will run from their daughters, sons,